Thank you all for joining us for our afternoon session. Uh, we're going to open this session. We have a special message uh, from the President of the Republic of China, uh, known as Taiwan, and uh, that will be played over video. He was not able to join us in person, so they've sent a special video message. This will be from President William Lai. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens. IRF Summit Co-Chairs, Ambassador Sam Brownback, and Dr. Katrina Lentil Strait, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm honored to speak to you all today for the International Religious Freedom Summit Asia. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank IRF Summit Co-Chairs, Ambassador Brownback, and Dr. Lentil Strait, and everyone who made this important event possible. We are now at a time when democratic backsliding and authoritarian aggression are becoming more widespread and countless people face persecution due to their religious beliefs. Now more than ever, we must reaffirm our commitment to freedom and dignity in which religious freedom is fundamental. Religious freedom has endured tyranny, which gained living memory in Taiwan. During martial law, preaching in the Taiwanese language was banned. Taiwan's Presbyterian leaders were also targeted by the authoritarian regime. However, through the relentless efforts of the Taiwanese people, the sacrifice of democracy activists and support from democratic countries, Taiwan became a vibrant democracy that now stands as a beacon of religious freedom in Asia. Indeed, Taiwan has come a long way in our fight for freedom and democracy. In the latest Democracy Index by the London-based Economist Intelligence Team Unit, Taiwan ranked 10th in the world and 1st in Asia. And in the newest report from the US-based Freedom House, Taiwan scored 94 out of 10, 100 for freedom overall, and a perfect score in freedom of expression and belief. Taiwan's religious freedom sets a global standard, and we are part of the inclusiveness, diversity, and interface dialogue for which we are known. Our religious diversity has also strengthened the Taiwanese people's conviction of the importance of religious freedom. Returning to our history, foreign missionaries came to Taiwan in the mid-19th century and offered the medical services as they carry out their evangelical work. That spirit continues today as religious communities throughout Taiwan are still dedicated to medical care, charity, special education services, and disaster relief at home and abroad. Their contributions have not only made our society and the world a better place, but also served as a bridge connecting Taiwan with the world. Yet, like other democratic values, religious freedom still must be fought for and protected. In recent years, we have seen religious freedom in many parts of the world erode. In China, for instance, CCP authorities continue to intensify repression against the Christians, Tibetan Buddhists, and Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, among other minorities. Sacred places of worship have been destroyed, and many devout believers have been held in re-education camps or wars facing such threats. Taiwan is determined to continue helping advance religious freedom around the world. In 2019 and 2022, we held a civil society dialogue, inviting advocates and defenders of religious freedom to share experiences and ideas on how to confront repression. Just last year, we hosted the Taiwan International Religious Freedom Summit here in Taipei. Two years ago, Taiwan also became an observer to the International Religious Freedom of Belief Alliance. This allows us to cooperate and coordinate even more 
with like-minded countries in promoting religious freedom worldwide. We are proud to be partner in these endeavors and voice support on the international stage for those in need. While the world still faces significant challenges to religious freedom, Taiwan's partnerships with like-minded countries have never been stronger. Taiwan will remain a steadfast ally in support of religious freedom, standing strong for our common values and commitments to maintaining our free and democratic way of life. Together, let's continue striving for a world where all can follow their beliefs without fear. Thank you. I would like to invite up our next panel that will be chaired by Katrina Lantos Sweat. This panel is on enshrining religious freedom in Asian democracies. It's wonderful to be back with all of you. I hope you had a great lunch, and we have clearly been well fed by the panels and the discussions this morning, and I know a lot of the most important conversations take place, not in this room, but really in the, the people that you get a chance to meet and network with and exchange ideas. So we're excited to be back for another really interesting conversation. Before I launch into the questions with our distinguished panelists, I just want to say, first of all, that it was wonderful to hear those remarks from the president of Taiwan. Taiwan has really stepped out to become a leader in this field. And, you know, I think they see, they, they are doing it not only because they have a deep conviction that this is a fundamental value that they want to advance, but it is something that shows the difference between Taiwan and China. And they want the West and, and the democratic world to see that and to say, yeah, these folks are our allies across the board and we have to be there with them. It is sort of a tie that binds. So um, I, I really hope that we will see a similar kind of stepping up and stepping forward in Japan following this summit because Japan has potentially an incredibly important role to play. I also, and I know you'll have the opportunity to hear from this very distinguished individual later today, but I simply have to mention that our former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has joined us. And I had the opportunity during the period of time that I served as Chair and Vice Chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom to really sort of see how various secretaries of state dealt with advancing this fundamental right. And although I am a lifelong Democrat, I have to say that we have never had a secretary of state who did as much to really put this issue front and center in our human rights agenda. You know, for so many years, religious freedom, earth, forb, whatever you want to call it, was a little bit of an orphan right. You know, it was sort of off there on the side, lip service was paid, but there wasn't a lot of actual engagement on the issue. But um, Secretary Pompeo first, um, I, I mean, he wasn't the only one who did it, but he worked side by side and I'm sure played a role in um, choosing the best uh, ambassador at large for religious freedom that we've ever had, my dear friend and, and, and illustrious leader, Ambassador Sam Brownback. But he convened the first ever ministerial level gathering of um, not only civil society, but top governmental leaders in Washington, D.C. He authored the Potomac Declaration, and honestly, I could go on at great length. So Secretary Pompeo showed through his policy initiatives his actions, as well as his words, that this was not a sidebar issue. This was a central issue, and one that addresses not only the values that our country sought to advance, but also our national security interests, our public policy interests, our diplomatic initiatives. So please join me in giving a really, really warm round of applause to Secretary Pompeo. So I'm joined up here today by two fabulous panelists, Ambassador Rob Rahak, 
who um, leads IRFBA, the International Religious Freedom and Belief Alliance, and Reverend Miyake, who I just met today, who is a leading figure within the Shinto faith community here in Japan. And we're going to be talking about uh, why it is important to centrally enshrine international religious freedom within the context of Asia. But I'd like to first begin, if I can, Ambassador Rahak, with asking you to talk about sort of what, what in your background might have pulled you into a passion for this cause. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like uh, first to thank you for the invitation and to the organizers, uh, both of you. And also, uh, let me express that I'm a big admirer of Japanese uh, uh, culture, traditions, and spiritual values, uh, and also technology. I buy just Japanese cars. <laughs> I did Aikido and Judo. And uh, also, uh, I admire the values, including the Japanese fight for human rights. So, konnichiwa. Uh, and uh, before I start, uh, I would like to start with a joke because I know that Japanese people they have very good sense of humor. Uh, can I start with joke? Yes. You have okay. Our permission. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry, but it will be about American, French, a Jew, and a Jew. The three guys met after some time, and they are discussing what was the most happiest moment in the previous year. And the American says, you know, my team made it up to the Super Bowl and they won. And the French guys say, you know, I had fantastic dinner on the French Riviera with the candlelights, great French wine. This was my happiest time. And the Jew says, you guys, I was in my flat in Moscow and 3 a.m. knocking on the door. I was afraid, so I came to the door. I looked through the peephole, and there were three guys with long coats knocking the door. And I trembled and asked, what, what do you want? And they asked, does our comrade Ivan Ivanovich Live here? <laughs> My name is Yitzik, so I was not the person. <laughs> uh, Winston Churchill once said that democracy means if somebody knocks your door at 3 a.m., it's probably a milkman. <laughs> and before I start, I would like to share with you that uh, we need to ensure that nobody around the globe should be afraid and fear that if somebody knocks his door, that they are going to get him. And believe me that most of the uh, population around the globe and most of the people around the globe, they don't have really freedom of religion or conscience, and they have to live in fear. And if we are in those countries like Japan, that have full democracy, very nice life, the beautiful Japanese gardens that I visited today morning, we should think about those people who are in troubles around the globe, and our responsibility is to help them. You ask me about my personal story. So I grew up behind the Iron Curtain. As a student, I was just at the high school I was 15, 16 years old. Once I went to the lecture about religion, and when I came next day to the school, there were two police, communist police cars in front of my, of my school. And I thought somebody get killed here because they sent two cars. The answer was they sent the cars because of me to start investigation how student can dare to go to be interest, uh, to have an interest in religions, and they wanted to kick me off the school. Uh, they didn't succeed because this was the year 1989, 
we students did the revolution and we made it. After the Velvet Revolution, we have free society, democracy, and we have the obligation to help others. And I think this is our shared obligation of everybody who lives in the free world to fight those who don't. That's, that's such a compelling story. And you know, you, you were fortunate that it was 1989 and not 1959 or 64, because you might well have found your life really derailed. I just have to mention one thing, because when you brought up that you do judo, I had not thought of this in many years, but I'm very proud to say that when I was a little girl, probably seven or eight years old, I announced to my mother that I wanted to take judo lessons. And um, I'm quite an old lady, so that was a long time ago, and not many girls did judo back then. And we went to the local um, dojo in our town, and there were, I think, 45 boys in the class and not a single girl. And the, the sensei, the sort of head of the dojo, was very skeptical. Um, he didn't know if he was going to let this little girl join, but he did, for which I was very grateful. And I had a great time and, um, and actually threw a lot of boys out of the ring. So, uh, so that was sort of the beginning of my, of my feminist streak, going way, way back. But um, Reverend Miyagi, first of all, we're so honored to have you here with us today. And you have, for many years, been working in the interfaith space. Um, but I would be so grateful. I know you have a, a presentation you're going to share with us. So if you would begin with that, and then later on, as, as the conversation goes on, I'll have some questions to throw at you. Thank, thank you, Madam Moderator. And uh, um, first of all, I should say I'm so sorry. I've never practiced judo. Oh. <laughs> it was the Shinto priest, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and also, the pre uh, recently, the most judo players' populations, the biggest populations country is France, no. not Japan. Is that true? Uh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> well, it's a very successful Japanese export. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, before starting uh, uh, my, my presentation, I prepared, uh, in the, uh, when I asked to the, the, the organization, organizers, so he said uh, three minutes, mm -hmm. something. And I prepared uh, my papers, but the uh, uh, recent uh, Microsoft pro troubles, oh, yeah. all, all of my contents has gone. <laughs> and last, uh, yesterday I, I wrote again, just uh, be patient to listen my poor English. Okay, I will read. <clears throat> The issue of religious freedom in Asia brings to mind the issue of <coughs> depression of the certain religious and ethnic groups by dictatorial powers and authoritarian state, whether secular or relig uh, religious, such as the People's Republic of China and the Islamic Republic of Iran. In fact, until last fall, as I was a board member of for 40 years of the International Association for Religious Freedom, very similar name of this organization, it has a 125 years old NGO at the, and it has a general consultative status with the UN ECOSOC councils. I know that these issues are very important. However, the summit includes human rights experts such as the Dalai Lama's representatives, uh, uh, Dr. Aruya this morning and the Uyghur Human Rights Project this morning. So, <clears throat> and also in addition, the former, just the former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, is also joining. He has been working to stop communist China, which has unleashed uh, its ambition to est establish global he hegemony by the defeating the United States, not only in human rights issues, but also in all areas of the politics, economics, and the military affairs, China. I will do not discuss the issues of China in this panel session. What I would like to realize is, is the fact that event is uh, even in the mature democratic society like Japan, where a complete freedom of religion is recognized by the constitution, but belonging, uh, belonging to a particular new religion are covered, uh, covered by the mass media as if they were gossipy the celebrities. 
if someone tries to defend the people who belongs to the particular new religion from the standpoint of respecting the most basic human right of religious freedom, uh, it, is, it is routine for the person to be harassed by the group of malicious lawyers. Uh, moreover, it is lamentable that the, even the national diet, uh, which, which is the source of democratic power, even House members uh, turned, a, turned a blind eye to the social er eradication of, the, of uh, certain new religions for fear of being criticized by being cross closely Associated with, associated with a particular cult by the mass media, which attacks a certain new religion and play the side of justice law. Currently, the most, most problematic case in Japan is the government attempt to take away the judicial personality from the religious corporation, uh, even the uh, registering legis new uh, law New, uh, new law to prevent uh, proceeding uh, activities of the particular religious group. Even communist state that have the supposed, origi uh, supposed religion claim the freedom of religion is recognized in our constitution. However, in the, con <coughs> in the communist state, the freedom of not to believe the religion is also recognized. So the logic goes, one can attack religion as a mature democratic country like Japan is indeed not like communist country, but even so, the process of the ongoing that the government says that certain religious organizations, your religious freedom is 100% guaranteed. However, for your violation of the relevant laws and regulations, your religious uh, juridical personality will be forfeited. The point we must focus on is that religious freedom is an individual internal matter, and it is out of the question and impossible for the state to interfere with it by law. What is important for the guaranteeing freedom of religion is to give a judicial personality to the religious group necessary to the build and maintain the temples of church facilities and to employ priests, uh, the pastors, to the respond to the trust of the group of followers. The logic, the logic of guarantee you believe freedom, but not to give a religious judicial personality, is the same as, a, as a, that of a communist state, which guaranteed freedom of religion, but also freedom not to believe in religion. In addition, a new law that named the law uh, concerning prevention of improper solicitation of democracy, uh, d donation by judicial persons, which is the basis on the issue of currently the Japanese court was hurried submitted by the, to the national parliament on December 1st, 2022, to dodge the criticism over the shooting assassination of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The new law was passed by both House of in the both houses of the diet in only 10 days and, even, and without proper deliberation and enacted with, with an un, unpre, un, unprecedented speed and came into the effect on January 5th, uh, 2023. I think this is a completely bad law, but since the law is a law, even if it's a bad law, it must be observed in the state government by the rule of law. However, the principle of the cri uh, criminal jury, jury difficult to pronounce, juris pro producers, um, which prohib prohibits the operation of ex post facto laws, is the basic law, a basic uh, uh, pre premise of the modern state, state of law, and it it is not pro. Permissible, for, permissible from the legal standpoint to say that endowment act at a certain religious organizations before demo, uh, December 2022 were illegal, according to a law that 
came into effect in January uh, 2023. This is uh, one of the examples uh, uh, in Japan which I confront. Uh, some of the audience this afternoon also belonging that uh, religious organization's members. So uh, religious freedom point is very important uh, from uh, this, uh, this uh, perspective. And uh, many people that this morning says Japan is a democratic country and uh, guaranteed 100% uh, religious freedom. But legally, we have uh, religious freedom. But still, we have some problems in, in, in this matter. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And you know, for myself, uh, Ambassador Rehak, we come here as guests in Japan. And we obviously are full of admiration for so many things that we see here. So it's actually very enlightening for you as somebody, you know, a, an important religious figure here in Japan to share with us some very legitimate and real concerns. And I particularly appreciate you pointing out that historically, and apparently even in our day, it always seems to be easiest to target new emerging faith communities, you know? You, uh, you know, those who are Christian can look back to the origins of Christianity and the unbelievable persecution that that faith community suffered. And I think as we look at, at many countries and many faiths, both historically and in a contemporary context, we see that there's this very unfortunate instinct to, to be suspicious, to be hostile, to be exclusionary towards the newer faith communities that emerge. So that was really very interesting, and thank you for, for raising those issues. Now, getting back to what we've been talking about a lot, which is our desire to, to sort of um, engage Japan, to become not just a, a supporter or a lukewarm supporter, but a real advocate, would you talk, Ambassador Rayak, about the um, International Religious Freedom and Belief Alliance, what it does, and and why you think Japan, if it were to join the alliance, could really be a significant player? Uh, I do that, but maybe I, I will start a, a little bit from the global perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, somebody who lives in Central Europe, Czech Republic, Prague, we live in one of the most difficult times of all my life at least, uh, maybe the most difficult situation after the Second World War. There were three main crises that started uh, in our time. First, it was the health crisis, then still ongoing economic crisis and security crisis because of Russian aggression against Ukraine. And now we live really in danger that the conflict will be bigger and bigger and we don't see the end. And in this time, the tensions are growing. And who is suffering are the religious minorities. Because if there is a tension, always you look for somebody to blame or to push on. So people of different views are suffering. Also, my hope was always that the gr democracy is growing. But right now, it doesn't seem to be the case. According to a study uh, that I read in Financial Times, the level of uh, democracy in the world declined to the year of 1989. And if you see the, the trends in the world, it doesn't seem that authoritarian regimes like China or Russia would lose the power. Maybe the opposite is the true. In this situation, it's really crucial that you have something on the other side, somebody who will face the phenomena and work closely together in order not to allow to anybody around the globe to be oppressed because of his belief or conscience. Uh, we, are, we have here two gentlemen who started this alliance. It calls uh, International Religious uh, uh, Belief, uh, a religious, I'm sorry, Freedom and belief. Uh, freedom, uh, religious freedom or belief alliance, who started this alliance in 2018, uh, Ambassador Samuel Brumberg and uh, Mike Pompeo in Washington, D.C. In those days, there were 17 countries who gathered together in order to build 
cross-governmental cooperation. This is very important because we have a lot of uh, civil society, but we have only this alliance for intergovernment cooperation. Since then, it grew up, up to the 43 countries around the globe who fight together in order to spread diversity, to spread freedom of expression, freedom of belief, which is actually the one of the strongest tools against authoritarian regimes. When Ambassador Samuel Bramberg started, he was the only ambassador at large. Today, we have 16 special envoys responsible for freedom uh, of religion by different governments around the globe, which is on the other, I spoke about the tensions, so you have many people on the other side who understand the difficult times we face, who gather together, join the forces, and work, uh, work together towards uh, tolerance, human rights, freedom of religion. Japan, in my eyes, could be one of the key players in Asia region. Because Japan, with uh, the vision of uh, traditions, human rights, and technologies, mm -hmm. would be, could be the, the, the leader of the whole region who could influence uh, not only the uh, cases of many individual people who suffer and they are prison, but also the whole spirit in the region. Uh, and the technologies are starting to be beyond our control. I see that AI, uh, we were afraid that once will come time that you will be not able to recognize is something uh, is product of AI or a live person. The times came. We live in the time that you will be not able to recognize. Just uh, yesterday, somebody sent me a video that was made uh, on behalf of my videos on YouTube, that I was speaking on the video, I saw myself, I heard myself, and I could not see it's not myself, it's product of AI. Mm. It was very terrifying. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the AI is also misused for surveillance. We spoke about the Uyghurs here. The Uyghurs, they can't go to buy even the, uh, the ticket for the train because the every, everywhere is the face recognition. 24-7 uh, under the surveillance. The technologies, if we don't change the course, we will not able to, uh, to escape from the surveillance and, uh, and misuse of technologies. So are you one more thing, yeah. no, no, just one more, yeah. just one more. Uh, the key is to have countries like Japan, who is leader in technologies, to make it vice versa, and you use AI for our sake, for the people, for good PR, for promotion of tolerance, religious freedom. And this is step we have to do together. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. And a frightening prospect you raise, but so important. So, um, Reverend Miyagi, if you could sort of respond to what Ambassador Rahak said, how do you see Japan emerging in a leadership role? And what about his suggestion that, you know, that Japan really, because of its technological expertise, could, could help us all to better navigate how we, how we avoid the very, very clear pitfalls of a of a potentially dystopian world of AI. Thank you. Uh, last week, I attended uh, uh, one international conference in Hiroshima, and the title is AI and uh, uh, AI and Ethics. And uh, this is uh, four organizations uh, uh, co-sponsored. Uh, co one first one is uh, uh, Pontifical Con Pontifical Academy for Life. And the second one is. Uh, Abu Dhabi Peace Forum, and the third one is uh, Israeli's Chief Rabbi's Commission for Interface Dialogue, and the fourth one is uh, Religion for Peace, and I attended. Uh, this uh, conference is very, very unique, because not only for religious leaders, but uh, the 
the president of Microsoft, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, president of Microsoft is also attended full days, and uh, also the IBM's representative, Cisco Systems representative. We talk uh, together with for the responsibility for the new technology and uh, human uh, ethics. And uh, I think Japan is a. I at that conference I mentioned about. Uh, in the past, uh, these this kind of conference operated by the so-called the Abrahamic religions countries. But uh, I think that uh, we need to add the element of the, uh, the like uh, Shinto, Buddhism, Hindu, and, and other countries, other religions uh, background. Especially for Shinto, has uh, think that everything has a, a life. Uh, uh, like uh, you know, animes, manga, or uh, the, for the new Japanese pop cultures, and uh, so we think uh, everything has a life, and uh, we don't sh uh, uh, separate from the uh, humanity and the other animals and other plants, and uh, even for the man-made uh, facilities such as like computers. So. So say, you feel that like everything has a spirit it's a sp of spirit, spirit. Uh -huh. So I says uh, I I show the one example that even the computer has a life because my computer has a bad spirit. Yeah, yeah, I just want to go on the record. I mine has a very bad spirit. Yeah, but. Very bad spirit. <laughs> That's right. And also the computer have uh, like a computer virus uh, received. The humanity also had a virus. So I think that's it's a, a good uh, analogy. So, I like so, that. Yeah. So, and I think the uh, this moment, the uh, 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 generative AI uh, coming from the front of the daily life. So this is a very important moment, and I think Japan has the possibility to commit for the different point of view for the uh, Abrahamic uh, ideas, and also the uh, Japanese people. Many of Japanese people doesn't recognize for the Japanese passport is uh, one of the strongest passport. I mean, the stronger than the American passport. We can go everywhere in the world except North Korea, and uh, so uh, the, we uh, government guaranteed 100% freedom for saying political uh, message. Even the prime minister, I, uh, many people say it's bad. Uh, but voice to the prime minister, the very same, similar with the United States also. But anyway, so and, uh, which means uh, Japanese people people has a duty for the support of the human being, whole human beings uh, issues, especially for the religious freedom. I think I always uh, support uh, push to the Japanese friend, especially for the Buddhist the Shinto le leaders to support for the human. Well, th this is music to my ears, and obviously. We're singing off the same uh, same page, but you mentioned earlier, um, yeah. Reverend, that you know the Abrahamic religions have tended to take, in a way, the central role in a lot of the efforts around religious freedom. But I I sort of want to follow up and ask you if you think, in some ways, some of the um, faiths of of Asia, yes. um, Buddhism, Shintoism. Um, and, and others that are not so much based on revelation, mm -hmm. but on the development of deep ethical um, beliefs and systems, might in many ways find it easier mm -hmm. to really embrace and implement mm -hmm. this idea of equality among all faiths. You know, when you have religions based on revelation, there can sometimes be a tendency to say, well, this is revealed, so we're right and everybody else is wrong. Whereas some of these traditions that are um, very deep and longstanding here in Asia have in some ways a more universalist appeal. Could you just talk for a minute about that? Yes. Uh, uh, for the Abrahamic, uh, the, according to the Abrahamic tradition, but uh, if I, according to the uh, Abrahamic text, like a Bible. Mm -hmm. So before Abrahamic family, all human beings are uh, the children of Adams. Mm -hmm. So no Buddhist and uh, Shintoist and Hindu is also the, the, the same root we have. So mm -hmm. and uh, at the, in the Genesis, uh, uh, the, at the story of uh, the Babel's Tower, 
bubbles, that's uh, the, uh, the human trying to big uh, the tall towers and uh, oh, the tower uh, of Babylon. Tower of Babel, bubbles, uh -huh. and then the god angry to destroy and uh, separate different languages. So we need a uh, simultaneous translation here now. But uh, <laughs> according to so it all goes back to Babylon. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but but at this moment, a very good uh, AI. Uh, maybe in a couple of years, we don't need any. Sorry for the uh, simultaneous stuff, people. We don't need simultaneous uh, translation because all AI automatically translated to, to, to yeah, the others. Uh, it means uh, we come back to the moment of Towers of Babels. Mm -hmm. So uh, the human beings, uh, again, to become a oneness for the one fa as a one family. For, of course, we have a different languages, different lifestyles, different cultures, different traditions, different religions. But a point of the uh, uh, thinking is uh, we are the family. So mm -hmm. this is uh, my point of view. And also Shinto has a very tolerant religions. When the, uh, Shinto is a Japanese original religion, but uh, 2,000 years ago, the Buddhists coming to Japan, no Shinto is reject for the Buddhism. So means that we accept Buddhism. So, in the Christianity and now the Muslims and Jewish, so and, many things. And didn't you tell me earlier when we were speaking that it's not unusual for somebody to practice both Shintoism and Buddhism yes. at the same time, which I think is very interesting and, you know, again, speaks to that idea that in many ways this whole like, concept of, of um, religious freedom and that mutuality of respect seems like a very good fit yeah. culturally uh, as well as religiously yeah for in instance uh, the right of passages when uh, the baby we got the babies and uh, first uh, past the one month we visit the shinto shrine for for greetings and then uh, get married uh, many many more than 90 percent of japanese get married with the western like a christian style Oh. Uh, go to church, yes. <laughs> and when uh, maybe more than 90% of Japanese, when he or she passed away, uh, visit the Buddhist temples, the Buddhist. So uh, that's, this I mean, very that's real interfaith yeah, and um, interfaith. oneness. And uh, my family succeeded Shinto priesthood generation by generation. But my, has, my, my wife is coming from Buddhist. And, uh, the, the, and uh, the Christian Catholic uh, 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 priest to, uh, to uh, celebrate my wedding. Oh, uh, ma married you. Uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> this gentleman is a living, walking embodiment yeah. of uh, yeah. harmony uh, and yeah, mutual Yeah, and, and my grandfather and my father permit to do this. So, so the, not only for the, uh, the, the mind or for the interface di dialogue, but the actual lifestyle also interface. That, that is such a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing all that. Yes, please, Rob. Uh, you ask about the Abrahamic religions yes. and Shintoism, Buddhism, and so on. There is a story that uh, was a rabbi meeting with his two students. Yes. And the students asked the rabbi, Rabbi, tell us, how can we recognize when the night ends and the date starts? And uh, one of the students said, maybe it's the time when you can recognize from a distance a sheep or dog. If it's a sheep, determine I or dog. Oh. And the rabbi say, no. So the other student said, maybe if you can recognize if it's a fig tree or, uh, or palm tree. And the rabbi say, no. So the students ask him, so when how, what will be the time when you can recognize that the night ends and the day start? And the rabbi answered, you can recognize it if you look the face of a stranger and you can see sister or brother. Uh, Until that. that time, the night is still with us. And I think this is the common ground of all religion that teach us to see the brother or sister in people that are even foreign to us. We don't know them. For me, the fight for uh, freedom of religion or belief, belief in the frame of our alliance that I rather call the Article 18 Alliance because the name is so difficult, IRVBA, <laughs> uh, because of the people I never met, 
they are far away and still we have the responsibility to fight for people that we don't know in person. You know, I, or, we organized in Prague uh, last November conference about the freedom of uh, uh, religion belief under the authoritarian regimes. We spoke a lot about all the authoritarian regimes. And I had a dream there that I dedicated each of the panels to some person somewhere in prison. And I thought that maybe once will happen that some, some of those people will get the program of the conference and he or she will find their name in the program and they will be really uh, uh, pleased that somebody encouraged, take care. Encouraged, encouraged, yeah. And then I sit in one restaurant in Geneva, in front of me, uh, Dr. Tang, mm. and suddenly he starts to speak. Mm. Uh, do you remember as you put the name of this Vietnamese prisoner to the program? I said, yes. Somebody succeeded to deliver him the program of the conference. He was already blind. He asked to read his name twice to hear that somebody takes care. It's sometimes it's enough to do a little bit, just a little bit, but it can be very important for the people. It can be great support that can, they can get. Oh, that, that's such a wonderful story and so important to remind us because, you know, we can talk about this at sort of that 25,000 foot altitude in big principles and big sweeping rhetoric, but so often it does come down to individual victims, individual sufferers, mothers, fathers, children, um, being persecuted, being imprisoned, being excluded from society because of who they are and what they believe. And we must not lose sight of the fact that we are fighting not for, for groups and not for abstractions, but for actual brothers and sisters, as the rabbi said, who need us to take, take up their cause. Um, we don't have much time left, so I think instead of, instead of taking questions, I'm going to give everybody here an assignment. So you've heard me, you've heard Ambassador Rahak, you've heard the Reverend and other panels talk about how eager we are for Japan to step up and become more of a leader. And one very specific, very concrete deliverable, that's a phrase we like to use a lot, what's the deliverable, would be if the government of Japan were to join the IRFBA alliance and they could play a really significant role in it. Now, I don't know who all of you are. Some of you are journalists and some of you are religious leaders and some of you are academicians and some of you are politicians. But I would really like to ask those of you, especially our Japanese attendees, to think about ways that you can reach out to your governmental representatives through letters to the editor, through op-eds, through um, meetings with governmental officials, and literally just say, you know, I attended a very interesting summit, the first Earth Summit in Japan. This is something our country should be leading on. We're not perfect, as the Reverend pointed out. We need to be careful not to weaponize the law, not to target you religious communities, but we can be a leader and we should be a leader. And I, I think, you know, I know uh, I, I come from a political family in the United States. When governmental leaders hear from citizens about an issue that they're not expecting to hear about, those, those letters, those phone calls, those editorials, they get noticed. And so I'm sort of, one of the hats I wear is I'm a professor at Tufts University. So I'm assigning all of you an assignment to please do that. And I'd like to close um, with a, an, a little analogy, if I may. So um, Ambassador Brownback talked about it. I have many of the speakers here have talked about freedom of religion, conscience, and belief being a fundamental foundational right on which so much of the rest of the architecture of international human rights is built. And the way I like to think about it is as a very complex mathematical equation. Now, personally, I'm a terrible mathematician, but I have a lot of admiration for those people who can do these tremendous 
equations. They're spread across two, two blackboards and they're using signs I'm not even familiar with because I'm pretty much at the plus minus multiply and divide stage of things. But it's fascinating to see. And I always am just full of admiration for the brilliant minds that can do that. But even though I myself am not a mathematician, I know one thing, and that is that if that brilliant mathematician makes a mistake early on in the equation, it does not matter how hard they work on the rest of it, the sum will not come out right. They cannot get the right answer until they go back and fix the mistake they made at the beginning of that equation. And I really think that no society can really get their equation right if they don't, at the beginning of the equation, embed a respect, a reverence, and a determination to defend the conscience rights of all their people. So this really is foundational. It really is fundamental. And we really, really are grateful to have this opportunity to share our thoughts with you, our anecdotes, our examples, our concerns, and our aspirations. So I hope you'll join me now in thanking these wonderful panelists, and uh, we look forward to what comes next. I would like just to add one, one sentence. Uh, we had fantastic pre president, Václav Havel, the late president of uh, Czech Republic, and he once said, Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. I would like to wish to everybody that we will keep the hope. Uh, we will not give the hope. We, in my country, we, we always were saying the Bolsheviks, they will be here for one more year, maximum two. And we used to say it 40 years until the Bolshevik went out. But we kept belief that the situation will turn into good. And this is something we need. Even the chance is very low, we should not to give up. Even the result will be not here immediately, we should to continue our work because this is the only way how to tackle the authoritarian regimes, how to spread the freedom for everybody, anywhere, anytime. Thank you very much. <laughs>